Ross Tucker, former NFL lineman, Ross Tucker football podcast, works for Sirius XM Westwood One. He worked the sidelines for the Eagles and the Saints game for Westwood One and joins us on the program. Ross, good morning. Thanks for joining us. What's the one thing that stood out the most with the Saints-Eagles game to you? Oh, my gosh, Dan. Probably the noise. I mean, I still have a headache. (laughs) Uh, You know, and I've been in a lot of stadiums throughout my time. Uh, That was insane yesterday. I mean, that, that probably was the loudest environment for a football game I've ever been in. I had some buddies that came to the game, and they said it was by far the most they ever heard. So that was a huge, huge factor in the game. I thought, you know, the Eagles jumped off sides a couple times. And really, after those first two drives, they, they just could never really get it going again. And some of that was injuries. Some of that was, you know, they had to take a timeout to not do a delay game one. So just, I guess the amount of noise they can generate was the biggest thing that stand out to me, but maybe that's because I still have a headache. With two minutes to go in the game, who did you think was winning? I thought, I really thought Dan, that the Eagles were going to score a touchdown, but that they were going to score too quickly. And that breeze was going to take the saints down to get a field goal. When they got the ball at the 27, I really thought that the Eagles should take the two minute rather than try to get one more playoff. I mean, you're at the 27 yard line. You still have a timeout. That's plenty of time in the NFL, the way things are now spiking the ball, plenty of time for them to get a touchdown. And it seemed like they hurried it a little bit. Now that's not the reason why Alshon Jeffrey dropped the ball or they weren't successful because obviously the ball went right to Alshon. They would have been in great shape at about the 20-yard line, coming back from the two-minute. But I I was really thinking the Eagles are hurrying up a little too much here. I had that much faith that they were going to get a touchdown, and I just thought they might leave too much time for Breeze on the back end. And I wasn't sure about this. I I go back to the national title game when Nick Saban, I thought, was very, very uncharacteristic of him by going for it on fourth down, Uh, You have a fake punt. Uh, It just felt like he knew that he was in trouble against Clemson. When I I saw some of the decisions made by Sean Payton, I I started to think the same thing. Like, you know, everybody knew you're going to fake the punt and you're still able to convert. I, I wasn't sure if Sean Payton thought maybe we're in trouble with this Eagles team and we're going to have to do some things. Desperate time, desperate measure. What do you make of some of those calls? I think you're exactly right, Dan, and that that's what he was thinking. They had to do something because even though they had gotten the interception by Lattimore, you know, the Eagles had stuffed them again. And they were actually fortunate, you know, the, the earlier when Brandon Graham knocked the ball out of Bree's hands. If Brandon Graham just holds on to that ball, yeah. the Eagles get at least some points there, and they're up 17 nothing. even if they just get a field goal there. So I, I think Peyton felt like, almost like he did in the Super Bowl when he called the onside kick against the Colts. I think he just felt like he had to do something to try to change the momentum of the game because even after Lattimore's interception, which you thought, okay, that might change things, they still got stopped. And the weird thing about that, too, is just like the national championship game, Dan, the Eagles had their defense out there. I mean, the Eagles had Fletcher Cox. That's the play Fletcher Cox got hurt on. So it's not like... They ran a fake punt against the punt return team. The Eagles had their defense out there, which I give a lot of credit to Mike Westoff and the Saints special teams coaches, because you're not supposed to be successful on a fake punt when the other team has their defense out there. I mean, you have linebackers and safeties blocking Fletcher Cox and like Haloti Nada on a fourth and short, but they went with, you know, a silent count, direct snap. And even though the Eagles had their defense out there, it almost looked like they weren't ready for it. They kind of got knocked back. Talking to Ross Tucker, he was on the sidelines working for Westwood One yesterday at New Orleans Eagles Saints. What kind of decision do you think the Eagles make on Nick Foles? Well, I think they're going to try to trade him. And I think they'll probably be successful trading him. What I think is the interesting dynamic of it, Dan, is they're going to give him the $20 million option. He's going to buy back the $2 million, I think, to buy out of that, to buy his freedom. And then he's going to force them 
to either franchise tag him or he'll be a free agent. If he's a free agent, he's going to get a lot of money from somebody because he, Joe Flacco, and Dwayne Haskins are going to be the three most highly sought-after quarterbacks this offseason for the teams that need and want them, Jaguars, Dolphins, Redskins, maybe Giants. So I think there's going to be a really nice market for Foles. The question is, do the Eagles franchise him so that's a higher number and then trade him, which would probably end up being for less than a third-round pick? But it, it might at least enable them to get him out of the NFC and trade him potentially to Jacksonville. I think that's actually what the decision will come down to. Let Nick be free for a third round pick, but then have to worry about where he might go versus trade him for potentially less. Cause if you're foals, you're not going to agree to a contract extension mm-hmm. with the other team. Why would you? Cause if you do that, then too, then you're hurting the team you're going to, cause then the Eagles will be able to get more in a, in a trade. It's going to be, the number one topic this offseason, that and what the Ravens do with Flacco, it's fascinating that both those franchises are going to try to trade those guys that have both won Super Bowls for them. Okay, but if I put this question to you, what's your uh, answer? You can have Foles, Flacco, you can have Haskins out of Ohio State, or Kyler Murray. For, for how long? Well, Murray, you're going to get for five years. Haskins, you're getting five years for the, the first-round draft pick. And then you're probably going to be looking at Foles and Flacco for two or three years. You know, you know what I would say to that, Dan? I think it depends on where you feel like your team is at. So if I'm the Jaguars, and I think we're good. Like, I think we have a good defense. I think we have a good offensive line. We just had a bad year and didn't get it done at quarterback. If I'm the Jaguars, I'm going for Foles or Flacco, and I'm probably taking Foles just based on what we've seen recently. Yeah. I'm probably giving Foles that that chance, although I think Foles-Flacco is a good debate. If I am the Giants and I've got young Saquon Barkley, I'm, I'm kind of skewing young and, and rebuilding young Odell Beckham Jr., then if I'm the Giants, I probably lean more towards – Dwayne Haskins or Kyler Murray. And out of those guys, I'd go with Haskins because I, you know, he's just unbelievably accurate. He moves well enough. I like the idea of him throwing Odell and Ingram. And I think I'm going to get plenty out of the running game with Saquon. I think there's less risk with Haskins than there is with Murray. So I'll go Foles for the team that thinks they're going to win right away. And Haskins, for a team that's rebuilding a little bit more. What's the Rams game plan in uh, New Orleans this weekend? What should it be? I think that they're going to try to probably start out like they did against the Cowboys. That was the single most stunning result of the weekend to me, Dan. And by the way, the other thing is that I, I just can't believe we, we had to have seen what, like 24 down attempts this weekend. Yeah. I mean, the NFL has changed, man. That the, so many of the times they go for fourth down, they would not have done that, you know, five, 10 years ago. I mean, there was, it seemed like three or four or five, almost every game. But other than that, my other big takeaway was the team that won the battle up front won every game but it wasn't necessarily predictive, right? Like I, I would have thought the Colts were better up front than the Chiefs. That was clearly not the case in that game. And I would have thought the Cowboys were better up front than the Rams. And the Rams ran it right down the Cowboys' throat. So even though we know that the team that wins up front usually wins, it's not as predictive as maybe we thought it was. Certainly how I thought it would go in those games. I think the Rams will probably start out seeing if they can run the ball at the Saints, especially since they lost Sheldon Rankins. But the Saints have had pretty good run defense throughout the year. So if that's not working, that's the beauty of kind of McVay and what the Rams have. They can change it up and go to the air and probably try to attack the Saints' safeties. But, I mean, if you rush for almost 300 yards with both running backs against a pretty good run defense in the Cowboys, I'd at least try that first if I were the Rams. Should the Patriots be underdogs? Yes, I think they should because the Chiefs have been uh, a better team throughout the year and the Chiefs are playing at home. We've seen playing at home 
gives you a distinct advantage. Uh, Arrowhead's the loudest outdoor stadium I ever played in in my life, Dan, even louder than Seattle. I, I distinctly remember being a backup for the Bills in 03, and Arrowhead was so loud, I was just like praying that none of the guys got hurt because I really did not want to go in that game. We were getting smoked, and I was like, I wanted – no part of going in and trying to block those guys <laughs> with that crazy noise, silent count. So, yeah, plus, I mean, Mahomes hasn't had a bad game all year. And the way they played defensively against the Colts, it's kind of weird that their defense hasn't been better. I mean, Chris Jones, Justin Houston, D Ford, the way the Chiefs played and the way they played all year, they should be the favorites. And I think, you know, the Patriots – they were awesome, obviously, yesterday, but that's not really how they played all year. So I agree with that with that betting line. Yeah, but it, it feels like it, it's rare for Brady to be in this situation, but it feels like he he loves the fact that he's an underdog. It feels like they've been underdogs this entire season, that, you know what, the end is near for Brady, uh, Belichick, you know, the Patriots dynasty. But here they are. You can't kill them. You know, they, you just can't kill them. And they came up with a game plan that you wouldn't have thought that they would have been relying on Sony Michelle to dominate against that uh, Charger defense. But, you know, that that's Belichick making adjustments here. And you have to factor this in, whether it comes down to it or not, whether it's, you know, fact or fiction, but it's Belichick versus Andy Reid. And we know that that usually goes to Bill Belichick. I would agree with that. Um, I think that a Chiefs fan would tell you it's a new world order <laughs> with Patrick Mahomes in there, and we'll see. It should be an awesome game. I, I still can't believe how badly the Patriots embarrassed the Chargers. It was a terrific game plan. I wasn't expecting that. I'll give Belichick, Brady, McDaniels the nod from a game plan standpoint in any one game situation, but – you know, the Patriots have not been as good on the road in the playoffs as they have been at home. You yeah. think about the road playoff games they've lost in Denver. I was with them when we lost in Denver at the end of the 05 season. You know, when they lose, a lot of times they lose in the playoffs on the road. So this is the Chiefs' chance. This is Andy Reid's chance. This is the one. Safe travels, Ross. Always got good to talk to you, buddy. Absolutely. Take care, guys. That's uh, Ross Tucker. Uh, Ross Tucker football podcast, also working for Westwood One during the playoffs, working the Saints and the Eagles sidelines. For more Dan Patrick Show, tune to Audience Channel 239 on DirecTV or download the Dan Patrick Show app.